Welcome to St. Andrew United Church of Christ, and welcome to the season of Epiphany. This first Sunday after the day of Epiphany, which was January 6th, the day that's traditionally celebrated as the coming and visiting of the wise ones. The season of Epiphany is a season of light and understanding and revelation that comes in new ways. And so you are invited to worship with us today and we're glad you've chosen to be here. Our pastoral associate, Emma Lone, continues on vacation, and so today I'm happy to welcome, leading worship with me, my husband, Tom, the Reverend Tom Miller Price. Tom is an Episcopal priest at a church of his own, and it's always a fun opportunity when we get to lead worship together. So I'm glad to have him with me here today. Please know that if you want to be more connected to St. Andrew in any way, there's information at the end of the video and on our website for contacting our church office to get put on email lists and calling posts, and we will um, connect you as much as we can. It's good to have you here. Please know as we gather that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome. Here. The heavens open, the Spirit descends. Jesus emerges from the water. And a voice echoes through the blue expanse. This is my child, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Jesus is named, claimed. We come to the water. We remember we are named, claimed. Can it be so? What a thing to be named, claimed. Let us worship the one who names and claims us still. Let us pray. O oh, star-flinging God, whose light dances across eternity, dazzle us into your presence this new year. Open our hearts to the mystery of your love. Awaken us to your presence, knit to the ordinary. Reveal to us what is possible but not yet present. Heal us that we might be healers. Reconcile us to you and to ourselves that our living might be reconciling. Stop us often, we pray, with news that is good, with hope that holds with truth that transforms, with a word tailored to this trail we're on. May the word of your grace guide our steps like the sun by day and the north star by night as we travel into the gift of a new year. Amen.
the 29th Psalm. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. The voice of the Lord is over all the waters. The, the God of glory thunders, the Lord over mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord causes the oaks to whirl and strips the forest bare, and in his temple all say, Glory! The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. The Gospel lesson today comes from the Gospel of Mark, the first chapter. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. May we hear the still speaking God in these words. God is still speaking. God is still speaking. God is still speaking. Those are words that are familiar to us in this church whenever we gather to worship together. Those words became a part of the regular language in our denomination, the United Church of Christ, a little over 15 years ago when they became a fresh new way to talk about what we've always believed. The God is still speaking words may be fairly new, but they stem from old words, historical words, words that were proclaimed first to the pilgrims. Yes, I know we just celebrated New Year's Day and it sounds like I'm talking about Thanksgiving, but today's scriptures and the New Year itself are a really great time to hear again or to hear for the first time, whichever the case may be for you, this great piece of our history. Because in 1620, the pilgrims sailed for America aboard the Mayflower. These were folks who would later become Congregationalists, which is one of the branches of our United Church of Christ. And as these pilgrims set sail for America, a minister by the name of John Robinson, who himself stayed behind, he sent the departing company on their pilgrim voyage with these words. If God reveals anything to you by any other instrument, be as ready to receive it as you were to receive any truth by my ministry. For I am verily persuaded the Lord hath more truth yet to break forth from God's holy word. He was saying there's more truth to break forth from God's holy word. There's more truth. There's more coming. And in today's words, God is still speaking. 
there's more to break forth. Those words are powerful. I think those words have helped a lot of people get more excited about their faith, too. God is still speaking, a living faith, not just a faith in a God who created the world and then was done, not just a faith that's seen in biblical stories, but a faith that is expressed through countless contemporary voices, too. And just as God is still speaking feels exciting and hopeful for many, I think it's also a struggle for many of us. How is God still speaking? What does that mean? Why don't I hear God? Am I missing something? Is there something I need to do to hear God still speaking? Is God really still speaking? Today's scriptures help me see an active, involved in our lives, still speaking God. In Psalm 29, the psalmist uses the phrase, the voice of the Lord. And he uses it over and over again and really helps us think about God's voice being in all of creation. Listen to just a few of the verses again from Psalm 29. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The glory of God thunders. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The voice of the Lord causes the oaks to whirl. It's through reading of scriptures like this one that the desert mothers and fathers in the third and fourth century began realizing that God was speaking through and being revealed through not just scripture, but also through experience and nature itself. And so Psalm 29 and many other Psalms speak of a God who we can see being revealed through nature. To say God is still speaking is to then also realize that God's love is revealed not just through scriptural writings about nature, but also through contemporary poets and writers too, and through our own experiences. God is still speaking through our experiences of nature. And of course, it's more than just noticing a beautiful sunset or appreciating beautiful flowers, both of which are great to do, but both of those things are something that pretty much anybody can easily do. To hear God speaking in nature, though, might mean pausing long enough to be overwhelmed to be overwhelmed with the realization that God is in all of creation and that we are deeply connected to God and to all of nature as well. To hear God speaking in nature might mean that we are so inspired that it leads to new understanding and new actions on our part in the areas of conservation and climate care. Experiencing God through nature might mean more than just a contemplative, prayerful experience. In today's gospel lesson from Mark, we have the story that shows up on this Sunday every year in our lectionary, the baptism of Jesus, which I almost always preach about in a different way, focusing on the baptism and, and thinking about John the Baptist and, and what that connection was. But today I want to think about the voice of God that shows up yet again in this passage. We hear the voice of God when in Mark it says, And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. God spoke through the experiences of the prophets and the writers of scripture through the psalmists, and through nature itself. And then, as if God wanted to say to us, I am still speaking, 
God came among us in Jesus, put on flesh, and walked among us to show us that God speaks through our humanity and through the human voice, perhaps allowing us to imagine that God might speak through others down through the ages and through you and me today. The God is Still Speaking campaign of the United Church of Christ speaks to this belief that God is a God who is active in our lives, still speaking, still calling us to deeper relationships with God and with one another, still calling us to examine our lives, still calling us again, calling us in each generation to see injustices today and to work for justice today, still calling us and again calling us in each time and place to see the injustices, still calling us and again calling us in each time and place to love more, to experience more love, deeper love, to understand more fully what it means to love, still calling us and again calling us to work for peace and what that might look like today. Still calling us and again calling us to live lives of joy and what joy might look like for us today. I find a lot of hope in a still speaking God when I recall some of our denomination's own history. I most certainly believe that God speaks to people through all religions and all kinds of experiences. And I continually seek to learn more about God outside of our own tradition. But even while doing so, I also find it helpful to remember our particular history, to reconnect again to our denomination's history, the history that I was first drawn to because it is full of experiences in which our brothers and sisters in the faith heard the still speaking God. And because of it, they were moved to faith and change in action. Listen to just a few of the historical ways in which the people in our tradition in our United Church of Christ, heard the still speaking God and responded. In 1700, an early stand was taken against slavery by the Congregationalists, a branch of our denomination. They were among the first Americans to take a stand against slavery. The Reverend Samuel Sewell writes the first anti-slavery pamphlet in America entitled The Selling of Joseph. And Sewell laid the foundation for the abolitionist movement that would come more than a century later. In 1773, our denomination was connected to the very first act of civil disobedience. 5,000 angry colonists gathered in Old South Meeting House in Boston. They demanded repeal of an unjust tax on tea. Their protest inspires the first act of civil disobedience in U.S. history, the Boston Tea Party. In 1785, the first ordained African-American pastor, Lemuel Haynes, is the first black man ordained by a Protestant denomination, one of the branches of our United Church of Christ, and he becomes a world-renowned preacher and writer. In 1839, it was a defining moment for the abolitionist movement when Africans who had been enslaved broke their chains and they seized control of the Amistad, 
the boat that they were on. They are arrested and put in a Connecticut jail while the ship's owners sue to have them returned, saying that they were property. Congregationalists, who would later become part of the United Church of Christ, and other Christians organized a campaign to free the captive slaves. And the Supreme Court ruled that the captives were not property and they regained their freedom. In 1853, the first woman was ordained as a pastor in the Congregational Church, the Reverend Antoinette Brown. That's why I can't ha help but have a little fun when people say to me, oh, you know, a woman pastor, H how long have women been doing that? And, and I say, 1853, one of my favorite parts. Ten years before that, in 1943, we got the words of the now well-known and loved serenity prayer, written by Reinhold Niebuhr, who was part of the evangelical and reformed branches of our United Church of Christ. He was a theologian that introduced to the world the famous prayer that begins, God give us grace to accept the things that cannot be changed, the courage to change the things that should be changed, and the wisdom to distinguish the one from the other. In 1959, there were Southern television stations who imposed a news blackout on the civil rights movement that was growing. And Martin Luther King Jr. asks the United Church of Christ to intervene. Everett Parker of the United Church of Christ Office of Communication organized churches and they won in federal court a ruling that the airwaves are public, not private property, and that the civil rights movement could not be simply blackened out from the reporting. That decision not only led to Martin Luther King Jr.'s work being broadcast, but it led to decisions to hire persons of color in television studios and newsrooms for the first time. In 1972, in our United Church of Christ, the ordination of the first openly gay minister, the Reverend William Johnson. 1972. In 1977, a National United Church of Christ Disabilities Ministry was formed and Harold Wilkie becomes the first to lead as an executive that UCC Disabilities Ministry. Harold Wilkie, who I was fortunate enough to get to meet many years ago, was born without arms. He was internationally known disabilities advocate, and he served as a pastor and an author and an executive in our denomination. When President George Bush signed the Americans with Disabilities Act, newspapers worldwide carried a photo of President Bush handing Reverend Wilkie one of his pens, which Wilkie accepted with his left foot because he had come to use his feet so incredibly well, rising above the disability that he had and being the first to be an executive in our denomination. In 1995, the United Church of Christ published our New Century Hymnal, a hymnal that we use in our worship setting when we're gathered. It was the first hymnal released by a Christian church that honored male and female images of God. In 2005, the General Synod of our United Church of Christ overwhelmingly passes a resolution supporting marriage equality, supporting same-gender marriage. 
All of those firsts and many others happened not because the answers to all of those things were neatly packaged in scripture, but because people of faith believed in a God who was still speaking through the scripture, the living word. And they believed that God was still speaking through nature and through life experiences. And they listened. And they responded. And so how do we hear the still speaking God? Perhaps it begins with faith that God is still speaking. And that God is still speaking often. We just aren't always listening. Or quiet enough. Or tuned in enough. The voice of God that came from heaven at Jesus' baptism and the voice of God that breaks the cedars and causes the oaks to whirl, as recorded in the psalm. That voice of God is a powerful voice. Sometimes God's powerful voice is heard in the still quiet times. Prayer and meditation. Sometimes God's powerful voice is heard in the midst of soaking in nature and feeling the connection and the responsibility that we have to the created order, the created world. Sometimes God's powerful voice is heard in the voices of prophets and scriptures of old and in poets and mystics of later generations. Sometimes the powerful voice of God is heard through our friends and through our enemies and through strangers. Sometimes God's powerful voice is heard in the voices of protesters and those demanding change. Sometimes God's powerful voice is heard through scientists and medicine. Sometimes God's powerful voice is heard through ordinary people like you and me. The season of epiphany literally means a time of manifestation of God's holy words. It literally means a time of revelation, a time of new understandings. And so may this epiphany season be a season of once again hearing the still speaking God in ways that are expected and in ways that are unexpected. Grace. Pure gift. Amen.
one of the ways that God has been speaking throughout the years is through the Christian mystics. And so each Wednesday for our weekday reflection that is offered on Wednesdays on our YouTube channel, I will be sharing with you words and prayer practices from a Christian mystic. This coming Wednesday, it will be from Bernard of Clairvaux. And so today, our prayer is one that comes from him. A prayer that was written by Bernard of Clairvaux in the 12th century. Let your goodness, Lord, appear to us that we, made in your image, conform ourselves to it. In our own strength, we cannot imitate your majesty, power, and wonder, nor is it fitting for us to try. But your mercy reaches from heavens. Through the clouds to the earth below, you have come to us as a small child, but you have brought the greatest of all gifts, the gift of eternal love. Caress us with your tiny hands, embrace us with your tiny arms, and pierce our hearts with your soft, sweet cries. We have been in a season of gift giving and gift receiving. And so now is perhaps an especially meaningful time to think upon what it means to be givers. Not just in the church, but in our daily lives. What does it mean to be generous, to share what we have out of a sense of our faith? Now is perhaps an especially good time in this new year to give deeper thought to what gifts we actually have to offer. Our gifts of money and our gifts of our very selves. And so I invite you to make a gift to our church through our online giving or through mailing in an offering. And I also like to invite you to give new thought and discernment to what skills you have to offer to others that you can celebrate. What abilities do you have that you can offer to others that you could celebrate? And what time do you have to offer to others that you could also celebrate in this new year? This final blessing that I offer today we offer throughout the season of Epiphany. It comes from the wonderful poet and writer Jan Richardson. May the path that Christ walks to bring justice upon the earth, to bring light to those who sit in darkness, to bring out those who live in bondage, to bring new things to all creation, may this path run through our life. May we be the road Christ takes. <laughs>